live an inspired life, how to attract spirit back into your life. Lots of things that are going to be very powerful for you. I encourage you to stay with it, and uh, we need more inspiration in this world. Back in the 1960s, when I was uh, studying for my uh, doctoral studies in Detroit at Wayne State University, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I used to listen to music, and a group of kids came over to this country from uh, a little town just outside of London called Liverpool. Um, some of you may have uh, heard of them. And they used to sing a song, the Beatles did. It was called, uh, Will You Still Want Me? Will You Still Love Me? What? When I'm 64. When I'm 64, right? And I used to think at that time in my 20s that I didn't really understand that song. <laughs> didn't think it would have any meaning at all. I thought no one even ought to be allowed to live that long. <laughs> so it just didn't resonate to me. But then, lo and behold, it happened to me. I turned around, and 64 was here. And I wasn't able to be uh, with my children at the time of that birthday. I was speaking in uh, Durham, North Carolina that night. So I got a package from uh, them with a wonderful card in it for me. And um, I thought, you know, maybe all of this work that uh, we've done with these children, with my wife and I, and trying to teach them about spirit and higher consciousness and loving and being close to God and spirit was coming true because they sent me this beautiful card. It said, inside of this birthday card is a very special message from God. And I opened it up and it said, uh, see you soon. <laughs> Happy birthday. So, uh, there it is. And my children have been a great source of inspiration to me. They have given me some of the best material I could ever have. <laughs> I can remember one morning, um, I was making waffles for them. And I heard my uh, daughter talking, my daughters talking to each other. And uh, they were doing very slow. And, uh, and I had what I thought was really important things to do. And, uh, I encouraged her and all of them to, you know, speed it up a little bit. You know, let's go. We've got, to, we've all got to get in the car. We've got deadlines. We've got to get to school. I've got to get to work. I'm a, I'm a prophet. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I have to go think and walk the beach. I, I get paid by the thought. You see. Uh, and, uh, so I raised my voice a little bit and I said something, and my daughter Serena uh, took a took umbrage at what I had said, and I said, come on, let's go, get working, let's go, move, come on, I want to get to school, we've got to get you to school. And she just stood up and she put her hands on her hips and looked at me and said, I wonder what all those people would think of Mr. Positive if they could see him here this morning. <laughs> she turned around and uh, looked at her sister, Summer, and said, uh, would you buy a book from someone who yells at a 10-year-old child? <laughs> I write those down when they... So anyway, my children have always been uh, great inspiration for me and, uh, and great teachers and keep me very close to the ground and very humble. I want to uh, begin this program on inspiration with a, a story about, about attitude and belief, because basically the idea of living an inspired life is one in which our attitudes become one of uh, being in harmony with our source, with spirit. Not too long ago, I was, uh, I was honored by uh, Yeshiva University, the Einstein School of Medicine, with a, uh, a wonderful tribute. It was called the Einstein Award that is given to people who uh, whose work exemplifies some of the uh, sort of philosophical views, rather than just necessarily the scientific views of, uh, of Albert Einstein. And I was invited there, and I uh, gave a lecture to the staff and did rounds, and 
spent a day there at the uh, at this uh, wonderful school of medicine in uh, psychiatric hospital in uh, in New York. But I felt that when I got there, that maybe it would be important for me to uh, explain to them about uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, which I'm sure many of you watching um, don't really completely understand. But everything is really relative. I mean, there was a great Chinese philosopher who once said, his name was Lao Tzu, he said, I went to sleep and I dreamt that I was a butterfly. And then I awoke. And now I don't know. <laughs> am I a man who was dreaming that he was a butterfly? Or am I a butterfly dreaming that I'm a man? It could be either way. And Einstein said, it's all relative. It's all relative. And I thought about that. And I thought perhaps I could help these doctors and everyone to understand, since they were working at a place named after Dr. Einstein, I could explain to them about uh, how to apply this, this theory. And I have a theory about relativity that goes like this. All things being relative, in a bowl of soup, this is a lot of hair. What do you think? Really? You understand. <laughs> if you were in a restaurant and you ordered a bowl of soup and you got this much hair in it, you would call the waiter over and you would say, excuse me, what? That's a lot of hair. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. All right? It's all relative, and it's all how you believe and what you believe. As we move into this idea of inspiration, I'd like to suggest to you that you uh, have a mind that is uh, open to everything and attached to nothing. It's not a program that's based on any religion or any particular view of spirit or God or soul. We can call it what we want. We all originate from the same source. <clears throat> this source acts in a certain way, is constantly creating. And whether you're uh, a believer in one particular religious persuasion or another, all of us have to agree, even quantum physics teaches us that we all originate in this divine place of an organizing intelligence. And Alan Watts, a great teacher, a man I admired enormously, um, once said that you can't get wet from the word water. The word itself, whether you call it water or vasa or aqua or edna, it doesn't make any difference what you call it. It's the substance of what it is and not what we call something that I want you to pay attention to as we talk about spirit. And I'll use these terms interchangeably. Spirit, divine mind, organizing intelligence, God. All of these terms are terms that refer to the place from which we all came. And this idea of inspiration, if you look at the word inspiration, it breaks down to two words, in spirit, in spirit. And when we look at what it means to live an inspired life, it's nothing more, in my estimation, it's nothing more than finding a way for you to be in harmony with the spiritual essence from which you originated. Not just in your actions, not just in your feelings, and not just in your behaviors of attending church or being nice once in a while. In every single thought that you have. And I'd like to suggest to you that inspiration is not something that comes and goes. It's not something that you have one moment, and then the next moment it disappears. And this is a whole new look at inspiration. To me, inspiration is living in spirit at all times and catching ourselves when we find ourselves disconnected from the spirit from which all of us emanated. It's, it's, it's really thinking, thinking like God. It's, uh, it's being more in touch with that place of origination. It doesn't come and go. When you live an inspired life, you begin to feel 
as if you're on purpose. I guarantee you that at the end of this show, you will not have to ask the question, what is my purpose and how do I find it and where is it and how come I can't get it and why does somebody else have it and I don't seem to get it. It always seems to elude me. These will no longer be the issues that face you about being inspired. It's really about living day in and day out from this divine perspective of watching every single thought that we have and catching ourselves when we have a thought that is inconsistent with that divine source from which we all came. So that if you have a thought that includes you and your family, but excludes someone else and their family, no matter where they are in the universe, no matter where they are, no matter what they look like, no matter what side of the river they were born on, no matter what their cultural background might be, if you have a thought that includes some and excludes others at any time, you're not in spirit. You have left spirit and moved into something else, taking on a view of yourself as, uh, as someone who is separated from your source. So that you watch yourself and you catch yourself, and a big part of this program will be about watching those thoughts. Many of you know that I had a very powerful and important teacher in my life when I was a young doctoral student. He was perhaps the most significant teacher in the professions of my life. He wrote a very important book back in the 1950s called Modern Man in Search of a Soul. His name was Carl Jung. And Carl Jung had others in his life who were students. And Carl Jung had others in his life who were students of his, and one of those was Abraham Maslow. And Dr. Maslow's work on self-actualization and higher consciousness and teaching people that if you want to help another human being, you always put your attention on what it is that they can do to improve rather than on what is wrong. So you don't talk about what is missing, what is wrong, what ought to be, what used to be, unless you want more of that to continue flowing into your life. You put your intention and your attention on what it is that you want to shift and change. And he had an observation. Maslow's observation was this. He said, what is necessary? What is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. So becoming inspired is really about changing your awareness of yourself. And what does this mean? It means shifting the belief systems that you might have, the thoughts that you've had over and over and over again that say, I am limited. I don't have the talent. Uh, I don't have the background. Uh, I don't have the luck that I need in order to be able to attract what I want into my life. Things have never worked out for me before. Um, you don't, you, you change your awareness of yourself and your own body and what you believe about it. Like how could you have a body that comes from a divine source that creates from well-being and have it be anything other than beautiful? Have it be anything other than divine? Have it be anything other than perfect? A perfect creation of God of source, of spirit, is what it is that you carry around with you. And if you have any other thoughts about it, then you have to really work at shifting them because it's an insult to that from which you came. When you trust in yourself, you're trusting in the very wisdom that created you. And inspiration is about having that. It indeed, it is about recognizing yourself as a genius, recognizing yourself as a person of unlimited talent and the capacity to be able to do anything. And you'll be hearing a little bit later in this program stories about people who have taken exactly that attitude and said, there is absolutely nothing that I can't create if I can conceive of it in my mind and know that if I don't have the talent, that whatever talent is necessary, I can manifest it and have it show up and attract it into my life. Whatever financing is necessary, I have the ability to be able to connect myself to that. It's a knowing, it's a powerful knowing. 
I've been introduced a lot of times as the father of motivation. I don't know. First of all, I'm already the father of enough, all right? Eight is enough, all right? <laughs> so I don't need another one named motivation to be the father of. And I'm also pretty aware that it's difficult to motivate anyone. I don't know that you really can motivate another human being. In the process of, uh, of being a parent and then being a teacher, a school teacher at one time, a college professor, a, a lecturer all around the world, teaching on larger stages and smaller stages, and, and working with uh, my own family and so on, I really kind of think that uh, we come into this world and, uh, and we have an agenda that we need to fulfill and that um, the best intentions of somebody else wanting them for you isn't enough to motivate them. It has to come from within. And I think you can provide some guidance and you can provide some motivation perhaps in the way of uh, encouragement and being a, a model of what it is that you'd like people to do. But uh, two people can be raised in the very same family and have the identical uh, experiences and one of them can go uh, one way and one goes completely another way. I know it's true in my own family as well. So that if motivation is getting a hold of an idea and taking this idea to its logical conclusion and not letting anything interfere with that, that's motivation. And we say a motivated person doesn't allow obstacles to show up in their life and doesn't allow for uh, anyone to interfere with them and is really highly uh, directed towards a particular goal. So motivation is getting a hold of an idea and carrying it out. And we want to think of ourselves as motivated. And I think it comes from within. If that's what motivation is, inspiration is the exact opposite. Inspiration is when an idea gets a hold of you and takes you where you were originally intended to go in the first place. It's very different than motivation. The great playwright, Arthur Miller, most of you had to read one of his plays at one time or another in high school or in college, Death of a Salesman, being, of course, one of the most famous, uh, The Crucible, and so on. Arthur Miller was... Uh, uh, passed away recently, but he was 88 years old, and he had a, another play on Broadway at the age of 88. And he was asked the question in an interview in the New York Times, um, are you working on another play? And his answer really intrigued me. He said, uh, I don't know, but I probably am. Now, I think that there, that's really a very astute observation. When people ask me if I'm working on another book, um, I often say the same thing. I probably am. That there's something bigger. There's something that is greater in our lives. And when we connect to it, we allow it to take us where we were intended to go when we signed up for this whole visit in the first place called our incarnation into being a human form for this little parentheses in eternity. Just a little parentheses in eternity. I have one of my very favorite observations of this subject about inspiration from uh, a story written about uh, a man named uh, Wolfgang Amadeus, what? Mozart, of course. It's from an essay, Where Madness is Psyche's Only Nurse, it's called. It seems a would-be composer came to Mozart seeking his advice. How do I write symphonies, he asked. Mozart replied, well, you're young yet. I think you should begin by composing minuets. The young man was greatly annoyed and exclaimed, but you were writing symphonies when you were only nine years old. Yes, Mozart responded, but I didn't ask anyone how to do it. <laughs> now, the writer of this essay goes on to say that the most agonizing thing about this little Mozart story is that Mozart was not speaking from inflation, but from simple, truthful modesty. The reason Mozart didn't have to ask anyone how to write symphonies is that symphonies presented themselves to him 
invented, enlarged, produced all at once in what he described as lively dreams. Dreams that were so forceful that Mozart had to stop doing what he was doing otherwise and write out what he heard, almost as if something beyond Mozart's consciousness desired these symphonies to be written. Now, that is very, very powerful teaching, that these great symphonies that Mozart wrote presented themselves to him, and he couldn't stop it. Do you know, you don't have to be a Mozart to be in spirit. You can, you can find your calling by just being willing to listen, by just being willing to be someone who knows that it may not be in the writing of a, of a symphony that you're calling, that you're called to. It could be anything. It could be the adoption of a child. It could be the creation of a, uh, something that you've known you wanted to write for your whole life. It could be opening up a business. It could be raising horses out in Montana. Uh, it could be anything that you are called to do. So that the awareness that I'm asking you to look at is that there is, there is something that is calling you. And when an idea gets a hold of you, you get into this place of surrender where you just, you let go. In the recovery movement, we've always called this, you, you let go and what? And you let God, you allow this great spirit to be something that infuses you in such a way that it becomes this thing bigger than your life that propels you into directions that you're willing to listen to. But you gotta have, you gotta change your awareness of yourself, as Maslow said. And one of the ways that you change your aware, awareness of yourself is to understand a very simple, a very simple premise. Think of an apple pie. Here's an apple pie, and this apple pie, you take this apple pie and you take a slice of this apple pie and you put it over here. And then you walk over to the slice and you say to the apple pie, the slice of apple pie, what are you like? What are you like? And the little slice of apple pie says, I must be like what I came from. You wouldn't expect it to be pineapple. You wouldn't expect it to be cherry. You would expect it to be like what it came from, right? So why is it that we understand this, and yet we don't understand that we too must be like what we came from? We must be, we are, we are pieces of God. We came from a divine source. We have, to, we have to trust in our divinity. We have to understand that we are not this package of bones and skin encapsulating you know, these internal organs, that that's not who we are. That's what we call the false self. It's an illusion that who we really are is what we came from. And what we came from is eternal, it's infinite, it's kind, it's unlimited, it is, excludes no one. So that if we understand that we are really here as spiritual beings, just having a human experience, not the other way around. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience, it's the other way around. We, our essence is our greatness, what we came from. We must be like what we came from. I've just taken up this new practice. It's called yoga. Now, I'm 65 years old, and I've decided that there are certain things that I was told that I couldn't do at earlier stages of my life that I've decided I'm taking on. I don't care what my age is or what anybody else is told. What Mrs. McConnell told me in the sixth grade at Marquette Elementary School in Detroit that um, you don't have to come to art class um, it's really not for you. <laughs> you, you. You can go dribble basketballs, maybe, but uh, you don't want to come to art. This is just because she saw some of my uh, stick drawings that uh, I was pretty proud of. And then there was Mr. Tubbs at Denby High School in Detroit, who, when I turned in my first drawing in uh, 
drafting class. I didn't even know what drafting was. I just signed, they threw, it, they threw me in there because the, the school was so overcrowded. It was my elective. And I turned in my first drawing and he asked me the question, do you have a little sister? <laughs> like in the third grade, because she perhaps is the one that did this way. That was my uh, whole view of my artistic ability. I'm out there painting now. I'm doing painting. And I'm also doing yoga, all right? And I've learned some things about myself in, in the process of doing this. Like, the last time I touched my uh, forehead to my um, ankles, I think I was four months old. <laughs> and uh, I'm getting closer. Now, I'm not there, all right? But I'm getting a little bit closer. Each time I do one of these poses, I find myself a little bit closer. And I, I had a set of, of sort of a semi-belief that uh, I couldn't touch my toes while sitting up straight with my back straight up and sitting down and touch my toes without my knees bending. And I back straight up and sitting down and touch my toes without my knees bending. And I kept each day going in there and not being able to do that. The knees were up and the instructor said, you can do this. And I said, well, it doesn't seem like my body agrees with, with that. But uh, it would be, uh, and so he came over and he said, now I'm going to show you that you really can do this. Now keep your back straight. Instead of, and he took his foot and he went like this down on my knees and shh, my knees went down and I was sitting up. And the first time I had ever been able to do, it was like a change in attitude, a shift, a belief system that I no longer was hanging on to. And that's what we have to do. There's no, it doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what your beliefs have been. It doesn't matter what other people have tried to convince you of in the past. When you move into spirit and have a knowing that I have the capacity to be able to do this, you leave behind the false self. And the false self is really nothing more than this ego. Look, you came from a divine place, a divine place that is unlimited, that says you can be anything you put your attention on. And then you bought into a whole series of beliefs that were handed to you by very well-meaning people attempting to convince you that you had limitations, that you couldn't do this, that this wasn't possible. And I'd like to suggest to you that you took on something called an ego. E-G-O. An ego. You came in from divinity, you came in from a place of unlimited, you show up and you edged God out. E-G-O. And when you edge God out, it doesn't mean that you're sacrilegious. It doesn't mean that you're not a, uh, a moral person. It means that you take on a belief system that says, who I am is no longer this infinite divine being who can step outside and observe this body and believe that he can make it do whatever I put my attention on and use it to have the same powers that is spoken about in in the New Testament, even the least among you can do all that I have done, and even greater things. It's in within each and every one of us, except that we bought into an idea that who we are is what we have, who we are is what we do, who we are is what other people think I am, who I am is separate from everybody else, who I am is separate from what I would like to attract into my life, and who I am is separate from my source. And we believe in this separation, and we believe in this identity that who I am is what I have. So we start accumulating. We accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. The problem is that when you stop accumulating, and if who you are is what you accumulate, then you have no value as soon as your things start to disappear, as soon as they wear out, as soon as somebody else takes them, as soon as the government taxes them, as soon as any number of things. Who I am is what I do. If you no longer can do, then you aren't. You no longer exist. Who I am is my reputation. And we raise our children often to believe that what's most important is what other people think of you. Fit in. Do what, do what you've been told to do. Do what the crowd does. Follow the herd. And you know what happens is what you step in when you follow the herd. <laughs> So we take on all of these sort of false ideas and we have a tendency to believe them and, and inspiration is moving back into spirit and it's moving back into spirit in such a way that you no longer accept yourself as anything other than divine. A Persian poet from back in the ancient times in the 13th century. His name was Jalaluddin Rumi. 
And Rumi has this observation. It's been very important and very powerful to me. He said, the morning breeze has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. Let me say it again. The morning breeze has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. I'd like to take a poll. Just by a show of hands, I'd like to ask how many people in this room, and there's about 3,000 of us here tonight, I'd like to ask you how many of you awaken at one time or another between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m.? Let me just see by a show of hands. And if you look around, you see that this is a universal experience. Now, what do you think that is? If everybody, almost everybody, awakens at some time between 3 and 4. Now, for some of us, we just interpret that as, all right, this is my age. I'll just run into the bathroom and I'll be right back. <laughs> and you may make that visit several times a night. I don't know. But there's more to that. And I'd like you to th now, of all of those people who raised their hand at uh, this idea that you awaken sometime between 3 and 4 a.m., how many of you, how many of you awaken at exactly the same time? Exactly the same time with a little digital clock next to you. What is your time? 3.18. What is your time? 2.20. What is yours? 4.50. So like there's a, and, and this happens repeatedly over and over again. My time is 3.13. I awaken at 3.13 night after night after night. I look over, I've got this little clock. There's not a, it's not an alarm clock, it's just a little digital clock. I just look over and it's 3.13 again and again and again. So what I had trained myself to do in, in the writing of this book, in the, in, in the inspiration book, um, is to uh, put my feet on the floor and say to myself, all right, you are going to awaken because here's what Rumi said, the morning breeze has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. Do you realize that between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the night, this is the time when you're closest to your source? This is the time when it's the quietest? It is the time when it's the most peaceful? When there are the least distractions? And of course in Miracles it says the memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. A mind at war with itself remembers not eternal gentleness. Eternal gentleness. That's what you came from. It beckons you back to be awake. It's the most creative time in your life. Try it. Take that moment that you are, you are being called by your source and awaken and force yourself to shake the cobwebs out. And if you can't, then put your feet on the floor and say, look, if I have to go back to sleep, I'm going to sleep with my feet on the floor. <laughs> and after a while, that gets very uncomfortable and you, you'll get yourself up. Now, when I do that and I get up and I live on Maui, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank all of you for uh, <laughs> my beautiful home that I have on Maui. <laughs> And when I get up at, at that, so that is the most glorious time to be out there. And I go out onto the lanai, and I, I, <clears throat> I get this sort of this sense of this powerful feeling of inspiration. It just is overwhelming to me. And I walk by my writing table, and it pulls me. It's pulling me towards it. It's almost beckoning me and saying, please, please come to me. I, I want you to And I sit there sometimes, <laughs> and I... I literally wonder, where is this coming from? The words, they just, they just flow, and I sit there, and I write by hand. Uh, and as, I, as I'm writing and allowing this to flow through my heart and onto the pages, I just think to myself, I wonder, I wonder what's going to come next. I wonder when it's going to come next. It's almost as if God is saying, this is why you're here. And I can't get you any other time because it's just so busy and there's horns bunk and there's, all, there's so many distractions. But here's a time when you can just be with me. Just be with your, just be in spirit. Just be inspired, inspirado. Be in this space with me. And I will then allow what creative juices that you have forgotten about because you took a, because you edged me out. 
for so much a part of your life. And here it is. And you'll find yourself getting the right ideas, examining, examining things that you never thought of before. Writing, some of you, I know you do it in your sleep many times, you'll write a poem and it'll be so phenomenal. And then you'll say, well, I'll remember that tomorrow. <laughs> and then you get up and you can't get any of it. The morning breeze has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. Use those hours. And forget about the idea that, let's see now, I went to bed at 11. <laughs> and if I get up at 3, that means 4 hours. So I'm going to be 4 hours deficient all day long. I'm not going to be... Forget that. You've got an eternity to sleep. An eternity to sleep. And when you learn to meditate and get quiet and get peaceful, you can always... You can always, in 20 minutes time of meditation, any time during the day, get the equivalent of a full night's sleep. Don't go back to sleep. I'd like to speak in this program about what I call the rewards for inspiration. Things that will be your, your payoffs, your prizes, if you decide to move into spirit, into this world of spirit that I'm speaking about here on PBS. Back in the uh, 2300 or so years ago, we're not quite sure exactly when, there was a, a great teacher in India, his name was Patanjali. And in all the research that I've done on Patanjali, there's not sure if it was one person or a series of people or whatever it is, but it's great teachings. And I've immersed myself in the, in the discourses of, uh, of Patanjali and the sutras and practiced it. And, one of the things that uh, Patanjali, who was teaching people about being miracle workers at that time, teaching them about things that uh, no one had ever heard about before, about the power of, of the repetition of the sound of the name of God as a way of manifesting something into your life, teaching people about being invisible, stuff that's a little bit strange, but that's, you know, it's like being 65 has its advantages. Because you know? <laughs> I can talk about things that are weird, I usually point it out so you don't think I don't know <laughs> that this might sound a little strange. But I would like to suggest to you that he offered something about inspiration that I want to offer to you. And there are six of these things, and I want to cover each one of them in this program. He said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Three, your consciousness expands in every direction. And four, you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive. And six, you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Those are the rewards. It's not like you're going to win the lottery. It's not, and you may, it's, it's not that uh, somebody's going to come riding into your life on a white horse or whatever. It's, these are the rewards. These are the things that are going to be so powerful for you. The first of these is what? When you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, one, all of your thoughts break their bonds. All of your thoughts break their bonds. What do we mean by your bonds? Your bonds are the thoughts that you have that keep you disconnected from your source. They are thoughts that are out of harmony with spirit, with God consciousness, with God realization. Because this is basically about being like God, being like source, being like spirit, being like divine mind, in everything, in every thought, in every action, more and more, connecting yourself back, catching yourself. So the bonds are the ways that we think. I'd like you to imagine a, a ladder. And this ladder has uh, 10 rungs on it, from the floor all the way up to the top of the ladder. And at the top of the ladder is the highest rung. And at the top of the ladder is, are the words, this is my desire, 
and it's aligned with spirit. Again, this is my desire, and it's aligned with spirit. So what is your desire? My desire is to aligned with spirit. So what is your desire? My desire is to manifest abundance into my life. Perfectly aligned. We came from an abundant source. My desire is to uh, feel a sense of well-being in my body at all times. Perfectly aligned. My desire is to have divine spiritual relationships in my life. My desire is to get the job that I am working towards getting. My desire is to live in a place where I feel most peaceful and most loving. My desire is, and these, whatever it is, it doesn't make any difference, it's the tenth rung, it's the highest rung. It is your spirit aligned, aligned with your desire, all right? So here it is, it's right up here. Now you have to ask yourself the question, what is it that I offer up to this tenth rung desire, all right? A tenth rung has to have, in order for it to manifest and show up in your life, it has to have thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that match up to that. And if they don't match up, you get out of harmony. See, thoughts are energy. Like everything in the universe, it's energy. Einstein said that nothing happens until something moves. That we have has an energy component to it. We can measure our thoughts and how they impact us, whether they strengthen us or weaken us at any time in our lives. All right, so there's a wonderful book written about this, and it's called Ask and It Is Given. read frequently in the great teachings, I think among the greater teachings on the planet today. In fact, I wrote the foreword to it. It's uh, something that I very strongly embrace. And they talk in there about how to manifest your desires. And the mistake that most of us make is that we attract what we don't want because our thoughts are on what we don't want. Or we continue to attract what's missing in our life. We're not at number 10, we're at about number 3. And what are some of these on these lower rungs? It probably won't happen. It's very difficult. These kinds of things have never happened for me before. I don't have this kind of luck. We've got the wrong people in the White House. The economy is bad. Um, I, I don't have the ability to make it happen. I don't really believe it's possible. She said, well, of course. Who wouldn't want to be rich? We all want to have abundance in our life. Of course that. I said, so let me see if I understand this. You want to attract being rich into your life, and your thought about it is that it'll never happen. So what do you think you're going to attract? You're going to attract it'll never happen. And that very simple little example, it's an innocuous example, she was a very bright and intelligent lady, it wasn't about that, it's about what kind of energies we have within ourselves that we offer to what our desires that are aligned with spirit uh, in order for them to manifest. And every thought, on a, if you have a second wrong thought that it probably won't happen, it's not likely, it's never happened before, it's just not the way it works for me, it's always been missing. As long as you think like that, and you're in a universe that operates on this law of attraction, you will continue to attract it. A man named Albert Einstein, who I've spoken about before, is on its way. It's on its way. If you believe that it's on its way, then you will start looking for occasions for it to show up, rather than occasions for it not to show up. And then you will start acting on every tiny little clue that shows up in your life. Even obstacles become just something like, oh, this is just another test, you know. I can, I can pass this test. It's not, it's not going to be difficult. I'll, I'll get past it. And you can not bog yourself down in all the reasons why something won't work. Instead, you make the shift. It's on its way. I desire it. There's nothing for me to fuss about. There's nothing for me to worry about. I will not be in a state of anything other than anticipating 
that what I intend to create is on its way. And that which we call non-existent has not been sufficiently desired. By passionately believing in what doesn't exist, you create it. Because you know that it's on its way and there's nothing and no one that can dissuade you. I'd like to uh, go into the second of these uh, rewards that you'll get. Your mind transcends limitations. Now that's a little bit different than uh, all of your thoughts breaking their bonds. Your bonds are thoughts. Your mind transcending limitations means that you enter into the field of all possibilities. And in the field of all possibilities, that leaves nothing out. And in leaving nothing out, it means that you begin to see yourself when you move into spirit as unlimited in the exact same way that you were before you showed up. Unlimited. So you want to know what this spirit looks like? You want a picture of this spirit? Take a look. Take a look. You know who that is? That's my grandson. That's Tyson. And Tyson is a picture of bliss. It, you can't get any happier than that. Now, I, don't, I know I shouldn't tell this on Sky, but I see that. Now, I, don't, I know I shouldn't tell this on Sky, but I said, she said, Dad, the reason he's so happy is he's holding on to his little paper. I said, what kind of paper? <laughs> well, anyway, if you ever wonder what spirit looks like, take a look at that and know that that's you. That's what you came from. That's just a few months old little baby that is, that came from that blissful, perfect, beautiful place. Your mind transcends limitations. What does it mean? In a little village uh, south of Ottawa, in Canada, there was a young boy who went to school one day and his teacher began talking about children in Africa who didn't have drinking water. Now he was six years old and they said in the classroom that if you raised seventy dollars that's all it would take is seventy dollars and we could create a well in a village in Africa for seventy dollars so that they didn't have to drink dirty water and something happened to the spirit of this young man six years old first grade in school and he decided he went home to his mom Susan and his dad and said I want to build a well in Africa and they just thought well he's six years old he's a cute little boy right you're gonna build a well well, he said, no, I really mean it, and he, it stuck with him. It was so powerful. It was a powerful, because there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. When an idea's time has come, and it resonates within, within you, and you stay connected to it, it can't be stopped. And the little boy went, to, he said, can I do extra chores and raise money? And he did. He did vacuuming. <laughs> He uh, worked around the house, he raked the leaves, he did whatever it is that he could and he got a little extra money here and a little extra money there. And finally, after some time, he was able to put together $70. And he went to the t school and they went down to the place that had given this information and they found out that it took a lot more than $70. It was misinformation. That it really costs $2,000. And he said, then I'll do more chores because he knew that this is a world that is friendly. 
not a world in which you give up when you have a simple little obstacle like that. And he began to do more, making lemonade, whatever it was that he had to do. And he worked, and he worked, and he got his friends to work, and he got the neighborhood to work, and he got his parents involved in it. And he raised $2,000. His name is Ryan. Ryan Hurljack. Well, that's just the beginning of the story. Because as it turned out, he sent the money to this place in Uganda, this little village, and they built a well. And they invited Ryan and his mother to come to Africa and speak to the children of this village. As a young boy, he was now, I think, seven or eight or nine, I'm not sure of the exact details. And he went over there, and he began to give talks. And the people welcomed him there, and they were so grateful for this boy who had such a vision that he would bring drinking water to people who had dirty water that they had to drink. And he was so touched by it that they named the well after him, and they named a day after him, Ryan's Day. And they created a documentary about this little boy. It's called Ryan's Well. Well, today, that little boy has raised over one million dollars for water to be brought to the villages of countries in Africa where they didn't have it before. A million dollars. He lectures all over the country, the United States and Canada. He's in great demand. And when he got there, he had a little boy that was so connected to him that they were pen pals. His name was Jimmy. And it turns out Jimmy was an orphan. And Jimmy got himself into some difficulty after Ryan left and went back to Canada. And Jimmy was captured by rebels and was going to be either killed or trained to be a killer. And he had a friend who contacted the Hurljacks back in Ottawa, and Jimmy was brought back through all kinds of wonderful channels that were worked together. And he became his brother, and he adopted, they adopted this wonderful boy as, the, as their son. And that young man, when I saw the movie, Ryan's Well, on the spiritual cinema, I said, I want him in my audience because he inspires me. And I sent it home because I was working on the book and I told Marcy, I said, I want every one of my children to watch that and know there's nothing that can stop someone who believes that they can create something if that idea is within them. And there he is right there, my friend, Ryan Hurljack and his mom, Susan, and Jimmy. Stand up, let the world see you. Susan, Jimmy. has appeared on Oprah twice and the first time when she called and asked if he could come it was on a Thursday when he had something that he had to do in school and he said no and his mother said you're saying no to going on Oprah <laughs> I can't do it at this time and they changed the date so he could be on when she talked about her most inspiring young people you inspire me you inspire me you inspire me thank you On the 6th of April, 1994, the president of Rwanda was in an airplane. It was a Hutu, and his plane went down. On the 7th of April, a genocide began in the country of Rwanda, a country about the size of uh, the state of Maryland, with approximately 10 million people. Nine million of them Hutus, one million Tutsis. A killing spree began that um, all of the uh, young men of the country over the age of 14, and all of the males and all of the Hutus were issued machetes. The country shut down, an entire country shut down. 
All the schools closed. All the banks closed. All the grocery stores closed. All commerce ceased. And the business of killing was underway. People were being killed by the thousands in the streets and in the villages of this country, throughout the country. And those of you who saw Hotel Rwanda have just seen a little tiny sliver of it. In the end, by July, after 91 days, one million people, one million people, Tutsis, were slaughtered in this racial cleansing activity that took place. And in the midst of this horror, a young woman named Immaculate, Illa Begiza, was a student in a college about 200 miles from her village. Her father talked with her on the phone and persuaded her to come home. She didn't really want to go because it was Easter vacation and it's a long ride and it's, uh, it, it was through buses and so on. It takes a long time through country roads. The father said, you must come home. It's Easter. You must come home and see your mother and your father. And she said, I don't know. I'm not sure. But she did. She did what her father asked her to do. And she went home. And that was on the 6th or so of April. And when she got there, she's a Tutsi woman, they had to go into hiding because the killing began almost immediately, especially in this area of Rwanda where she lived. And <clears throat> she went into hiding in a pastor's home in a bathroom that is approximately three foot by four foot with seven other women for 91 days. And she came out, she's five foot nine, she came out and she weighed 65 pounds. And she survived through something that is so miraculous. She has written her story in a book called Left to Tell, How I Discovered God in the Midst of the Rwandan Genocide. It was such an astonishing experience that she would survive through the force of her total belief and connection to God. It was almost as if she had to become that from which she originated. She had to learn not only what God was like in her thoughts, and when you read her book, you'll be just overwhelmed. It's a page-turning book. <clears throat> but she had to almost learn how to be in a state of forgiveness to people who were hunting her. She lived in a house that was a two-bedroom bungalow by, our, by standards in America, and it was searched by between three and four hundred Hutus with machetes five inches away from where she and seven other women were hiding, just looking for scraps of food in order to survive being brought to her by the pastor. And in the home that she lived, the pastor didn't even tell his own children, because if he would, they would have been killed, because no Tutsis were spared, none. I'm going to read the introduction. I heard the killers call my name. They were on the other side of the wall. Less than an inch of plaster and wood separated us. Their voices were cold, hard, and determined. She's here. We know she's here somewhere. Find her. Find Immaculate, they were saying. There were many voices and many killers. I could see them in my mind. My former friends and neighbors who had always greeted me with love and kindness now moved through the house calling my name while carrying spears and machetes. I've killed 399 cockroaches, said one of the killers. Immaculate will make 400. It's a good number to kill. I cowered in the corner of our tiny secret bathroom without moving a muscle. Like the seven other women hiding for their lives with me, I held my breath so the killers wouldn't hear me breathing. Their voices clawed at my flesh. I felt like I was lying on a bed of burning coals, like I'd been set on fire. A sweeping wind of pain engulfed my body. A thousand invisible needles were ripping into me. I never dreamed fear could cause such agonizing physical pain. I tried to swallow 
but my throat closed up. I had no saliva. My mouth was drier than sand. I closed my eyes and tried to make myself disappear, but their voices just grew louder. I knew they would have no mercy. My mind echoed with only one thought. If they catch me, they will kill me. If they catch me, they will kill me. They were just outside the door. At any second, they would find me. I wondered what it was going to feel like when the machete slashed through my skin and cut deep into my bones. I thought of my brother like when the machete slashed through my skin and cut deep into my bones. I thought of my brothers and my dear parents, wondering if they were dead or alive, and if we would soon be together in heaven. I put my hands together, clasped my father's rosary, and began to pray, please God, please, please help me. Do not let me die like this, not like this, not, not, not like this. Don't let these killers find me. You tell us in the Bible that if we ask, we will receive. Well, God, I'm asking. Please make these killers go away. Please don't let me die in this bathroom. Please, God, please. The killers moved from the house, and we all began to breathe again. They were gone, but they would be back many times over the next three months. I believe God had spared my life, but I would learn over the next 91 days as I hid trembling in fear with seven women in a three foot by four foot bathroom that being spared is much different than being saved. But I did learn it, and it was a lesson that has forever changed me. A lesson that in the midst of mass murder taught me how to love those who hated and hunted me and how to forgive those who slaughtered my family. My name is Immaculate Ilibagiza, and this is the story of how I discovered God during one of history's bloodiest genocides. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Immaculate Ilibagiza to the stage. Thank you, thank you for your kind welcome. I'm very proud and very happy to be here on this PBS program taping. And of course, I'm very happy to be with Dr. Wen again. Thank you. I know my story is a sad story, but it has been a story that gave me an experience of great grow, spiritual growth and a deep understanding of what really matters in life. It is a story of everyone who live through any kind of injustice. I believe that also it has given me a chance to love better and to be able to put myself in other people's skin, especially when they are hurt. I always tell when that if maybe he was in my country before the genocide teaching what it teaches today, maybe the genocide would not have taken place. And I hope everyone knows and America knows what a gift they have to have him. Sitting down in deep silence of that bathroom for three months and being hunted to be killed every day through the worst time of my life, I didn't know that I was about to discover the greatest source of joy in my own heart, which was God inside. He is bigger than any pain. There are a few things 
I would like to share with you. I know that we can learn to forgive. Do not let your heart be disturbed because of any pain. I see sometimes people take a chance to hurt each other. For example, fighting over a job promotion. But one thing I have learned is that when you hurt another person, you hurt yourself in one way or another. The most important thing I learned in that bathroom is that you can't hate people if they are struggling with the truth. As the Bible said, they do not know what they do. After I got out of the bathroom, I learned that my mom, my dad, my two brothers, my schoolmates, my relatives, my neighbors, everyone was dead. Every material belongings I cherished, it was destroyed. I learned that to every pain, there is a great purpose. I have learned a lot during those three months, and I knew that those lessons can help me to face the pain that I was going to go through. And I chose only to look at that. And as Anne Frank said in her diary, I still believe deep down in my heart that people are good at heart and do not let yourself give up mankind. I know peace is possible. Thank you. The third of these rewards for reaching an inspired life is that your consciousness expands in every direction. What does this mean? Your consciousness expands in every direction. It means there's no up and there's no down. It means there's no right and there's no wrong. It means that there's no north and there's no south. It means that there's no beginning and no end. You begin to move into a consciousness place within yourself that you'll find yourself, when you move into spirit, you're gonna find yourself doing things that you don't understand why you're doing them. In 1994, when Immaculé was imprisoned in this tiny little bathroom with seven other people with no facilities she did something that I found so astounding when I first met her when she came to a lecture I had given in New York and I was so taken by her she didn't come to me and say will you help me I sought her out and said how may I be of service to telling your story in a profound way and what she did when she entered that bathroom is she asked the pastor whose home she was in, do you have an English and a French dictionary? And she learned English while she was being hunted to be killed. For what reason? Why would a, someone who is in that kind of a state practice, 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 day in and day out, up to eight, ten hours, and she couldn't speak. They didn't speak for 91 days no sound whatsoever. So, five years later, she is a survivor. She represents less than a half of 1% of the Tutsi women of Rwanda who survived. All the rest, all the rest were killed. She went into a place within herself and taught herself a language that she was going to need five years from now. 
That's what I mean by your consciousness expands in every direction. And then five years later, in 1999 or 2000, she had a, a when she was here in America and on an asylum visa, married, living out on Long Island, has two children, um, is assimilated into our culture, is a great spokesperson for, for transcending hatred on the planet. She woke every day three o'clock in the morning before she went to work at the UN and wrote and wrote and wrote every little detail of what happened in those 91 days. 150,000 words she wrote and wrote and wrote and gave that to me five years after that. And I said, Immaculate, it's wonderful, but your native language is Kinyawanda, your second language is French, your third language, you know, so she, we got help in helping her to convert it into language that would be... But how did she know in 1994 that she was going to be in America and coming up on, on a stage like this and talking to our country in a language that is her third language? How did she know that? Your consciousness expands in every direction. When you have an inkling, when you have, like Ryan, when you have a feeling within you that this is something that you have to do, that you can't be stopped from doing it, the whole world changes, and you start, and you listen to it, and you find yourself, if, you, if, if someone hands you a book, and then someone else talks about that book, and then someone else mentions it, and then you see the author on television, and all of a sudden you start saying, wait a minute, I've got to listen to this. I am being directed. I'm being called. I trust in this. I totally, completely trust. Your consciousness expands in every direction when you enter the world of spirit, and you get yourself pulled in these directions and you allow yourself to be pulled in that way. That's what I mean by your consciousness expands in every direction. Nothing is impossible. And whatever you find yourself doing, that's what you, that's what you allow yourself to do and what you allow yourself to be. You understand the Tao. The Tao is like the, sp it's the silence between the notes that makes the music. It's the space between the bars that holds the tiger. It's, you, you're a sculptor and you sculpt yourself a vase. And what do you think makes the vase? What makes the vase is not, is, is, is not the, the, the tile and it's not the, the, uh, the substance of the material. It's the inner space within there that is surrounding it. Without that inner space within, there can be no vase. And without that inner space within you, there's no you. You're not skin and bone and all that. You are, that encapsulates an inner silence, an inner place that is totally and completely yours, uniquely yours. Your consciousness expands in every direction. When you do, you start practicing things like kindness, where judgment was before. I've often said that when you have a choice to be right or to be kind, just pick kind. Why? Because it's more closely aligned with your spirit. You begin to exude something called love. You feel it for everyone. Believe it or not, at the end of Immaculate's book, she goes to the prison where the people who were her killers, one was her mathematics teacher, and what happens is that you begin to embrace a kind of love even for the people who would do such harm to you. And I'm telling you, that's what saved her. You'll see that when you read it. That's what saved her. The ability to go to that place within, that place of forgiveness. As Mark Twain said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Powerful thinking. You become an instrument of truth. You become powerful thinking. You become an instrument of truth. You become someone who listens. You become someone who is God realized. Okay? Your consciousness expands in every direction. I want to tell you something that I think will be very, very ha helpful to you. I want you to think about the troublemakers in your life. I want you to think about the troubled ones in your life. I want you to think about the ones in your life that are hooked on drugs. I want you to think about the ones who don't cooperate, the ones who uh, don't fit in, the ones who perhaps um, are disrespectful, use language that you don't approve of, 
use substances that you find difficult, people that perhaps you work at, but mostly I want you to think about people like that in your family. Now, I know that you think it's always somebody else, but they're thinking of you. <laughs> and I want to tell you about how consciousness expands in every direction when you take these people who are your greatest teachers, the people who have come into your life to teach you how to love them through what it is that they're struggling with, what it is that they are going through. And it's just, there's a, a need there, a need to be loved, that it's very difficult to love certain people under certain circumstances in certain ways, particularly when they behave in ways that are, that are uh, so troublesome to you. And I want to take you back in my own family, and I've been given permission to do this. One of my children who got herself in, into, into that kind of a state as a, as a teenager and struggled with her own, with her own self and her own uh, addictions and her own fears. And, uh, and the process over a longer period of time, I called together a family meeting. And I put everybody in the family together, and I had everybody in the family tell her how her behavior was affecting everyone else. And each person went through and talked about how difficult it was. I went through and talked about how I couldn't sleep, and it was bothering my. And uh, her mom uh, told her about how worried she was, and how scared she was, and how upset she was. And we went through this whole thing with. Uh, with this wonderful, beautiful child. And um, that night she went out and behaved in the same ways that she'd been behaving all along. Almost as if to say, um, I just don't need to hear how bad I am any longer. And I want to tell you something that I learned since then. I've talked to, I've talked to my daughter about this, and today she's this soul who devotes a big part of her life to helping people who were as troubled as she was at one time divinely beautiful, beautiful young lady. I want to tell you about a woman, her name was Peace Pilgrim. Peace Pilgrim was a woman, uh, an elderly woman who walked around the country and all she did, dressed in white, was go into different communities and she would just talk about peace. That's all she did. She talked peace wherever she went. And in the process of talking peace, she would, uh, there would be no ads and there was, no one knew her name. She was just called Peace Pilgrim. I believe there's a website about Peace Pilgrim today. And uh, I was in touch with Peace Pilgrim. And then it turns out she had read some of my books and we had communicated. And then one day she was uh, walking along the highway to another town and she was killed by a, uh, a car that didn't see her. It was an accident and she died. But she left a journal behind. And in her journal, Peace Pilgrim, this woman who devoted her life to peace, talked about the Bamemba tribe in South Africa. And I want to share this with you because this could be one way of returning spirit to the place in your home where there's emptiness, where there's hurt, where there's pain, where there's fear, where there's anger, where there's worry. In the Bamemba tribe, Peace Pilgrim says, when a person acts irresponsibly or unjustly, he or she is placed in the center of the village alone and unfettered. All the work ceases. The entire village gathers around the accused individual. Then each person of every age begins to talk out loud to the accused. One at a time, each person tells all of the good things the one in the center ever did in his or her lifetime. Every incident, every experience that can be recalled with any detail and accuracy is recounted. All positive attributes, good deeds, strengths, and acts of kindness are recited carefully and at length. No one is permitted to fabricate, to exaggerate, or to be facetious about the accomplishments or the positive aspects of the accused person. The tribal ceremony often lasts several days, not ceasing until everyone is drained of every positive comment that can be mustered. At the end, the tribal circle is broken, a joyous celebration takes place, and the person is symbolically welcomed back into the tribe. Necessity for such ceremonies 
is rare. Now, I'd like to think about that in terms of what I learned since the family meeting that I called a decade or so ago. If I were to do it over, I would place this beautiful child in the center of that circle, and I would have everyone talk about the wonderful things about her, about however, wherever we go, she, she just always thinks about the downtrodden. Dad, can we just take some donuts out to these workers, these, these migrant workers? They never get to have just some, can't we just go over there? Come on, Dad, let's just, let's just take them some donuts. Can't we just do something nice for this person? I would tell them about the time that she went over on Mother's Day and, and uh, bought a little, a, a, a little trinket for her mom and, and wrote a little poem next to it. That, uh, I would talk about how she made us laugh all the time when she was a baby and with that little tongue of hers and the little words that she made up and that funny little way that she walked and uh, her own sense of independence. And, and we would go on and on and on with this. And if we can teach those who are troubled, those who cause us pain, those who use language that we don't approve of, those who dress in ways, those who do things to their bodies that we don't think they should do. If we can just immerse them in a, in a culture of acceptance and love, even if they're behaving in ways that, that seem so anathema to you, if you can just find a way to continue to do that, eventually that spirit has to raise and your consciousness expands in every direction. And four, you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world. Your world changes. The world that you used to live in before you were in spirit is no longer there. When you're touched deeply by living in spirit, by awakening with the morning breeze, by catching every thought that you have that is not one of God realization, by finding yourself saying over and over and over again, it is my intention to be in this state of God realization. It is my intention to be there. I am going to live in spirit. When you do, the world changes. Things that you didn't notice before suddenly come alive. I'm going to tell you a story that just blew me away. I think it perhaps was the signature story of my life in terms of connecting to spirit. I've never experienced anything like this before. I finished writing Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling, on the 23rd of April. And <clears throat> I knew that the book was going to uh, have 18 chapters in it because 18 is that magical number, one infinite source, one infinite source. I put that number uh, on, on my dashboard of my car, I have it on the mirror, it's a, it's a reminder, one infinite source, 18. It's the number of chapters in the Bhagavad Gita, it's the number of holes on a golf course, it's got to have something <laughs> holy to it. <laughs> and. Uh, so I had 17 chapters written, and I was thrilled to have that completed, but I still had one chapter to go, but I was holding that off until my birthday on the 10th of May. And so, and I knew what that last chapter was going to be, my experience of, uh, of living an inspired life, just telling it on my birthday right around 3.13 or so in the morning. <laughs> so I was essentially done. And I went for a walk that day, and when I finished that chapter, that 17th chapter, I told a story in there about my friend Jack Boland. He passed away about 12 years ago. Jack was a unity minister in Detroit, a man who, when I wrote Your Erroneous Zones three decades ago, <laughs> called me up and asked me if he could put together some tapes on it, and would I give him permission, and he was he had started a unity church over on the east side of Detroit and uh, asked me if he could use that. I said, absolutely. I, and over the years, 
I began to uh, speak at his church and his congregation and, and come to Detroit a lot, my home, and we became very close. We became like brothers. And um, he got very sick, and he had uh, cancer throughout his back and so on. And I went with him to my friend Deepak Chopra's uh, place, the Ayurveda Center out in Massachusetts. During the day, we would go out, and then in the evening, he would come in, and Jack always had to have a story. It had to, he had to tell a story. And, and he started to, he start talking to me about these wonderful little creatures called monarch butterflies and how much he loved them. And, and the reason that he loved them, he said, Wayne, these are the most amazing little things in the world. I mean, they've got a brain the size of a pinprick, just no brain, essentially. And they're made out of tissue paper, you know, like toilet paper. They're just flimsy little things. And they come out, and they're, they come out of a, a chrysalis on, the, on, the, uh, on a branch in a tree in, uh, in Brazil. Now, they're, they don't have a brain, and they're made out of toilet paper, <laughs> essentially. And they fly to Nova Scotia, 4,385 miles away. And they spend some time there doing whatever you do in Nova Scotia if you're a monarch butterfly. And then they turn around, these pinprick brain toilet paper insects, and they fly all the way back to Brazil. But not only do they go back to Brazil, they go back to the same tree. Not only do they go back to the same tree, they go back to the same branch. And they start the whole process all over again with another cocoon. I mean, it's like, I've got a brain that's supposed to be pretty good size. I leave my cell phone <laughs> in the bedroom. I did this just the other day, and I walk out of the bedroom. I can't find my cell phone. <laughs> I have to call the number on another phone. <laughs> and I'm listening to this funny little sound that I'm, and looking under pillows, I know it's over. I had a call twice. Because <laughs> I didn't want to get charged for the first call. Well, anyway. Well. And, I, and these things can find the same branch that they, were, that they came out of a cocoon on. So anyway, he would tell me about the, the miracle of these things, all right? So I wrote that whole story. The, the 17th chapter is about the language of spirit, how spirit speaks to us in ways that we don't even, that we're not even aware of. It speaks in terms of alignments. When things align, when the same numbers appear, the same ideas keep showing up, when these, when these kinds of alignments show up. So I called my uh, editor, Joanna, who's here tonight, um, who's edited everything I've done for the last uh, 30 years or so, and can only, only person in the world who can read my handwriting. <laughs> Um, and um, I read her the handwriting, <laughs> um, and um, I read her the story of the of Jack and the monarch butterfly. And I called my friend, the president of Hay House, who's my publisher, who's also here tonight, Reed Tracy, my best friends in the world. And um, I read both of them the story. All right? And then, because <clears throat> I always do that when I finish a chapter, I read it to just see what it sounds like took off on my walk. It's 12.30 in the afternoon. I'm going for a walk along Kanapali Beach. And I walk, and I walk, and I get out to this place called Black Rock, out on West Maui. And um, I'm walking there, and I'm at peace, and I'm going to meditate, and I got my cell phone with me, you know, I found it, and... Uh, <laughs> a monarch butterfly flies right out of the tree, and I've, I don't think I've ever seen monarchs there before. Right? A monarch butterfly flies out of the tree and circles and lands right there, three feet in front of me. So I think, well, a little bit of a coincidence, but uh, you know, that's because I just wrote, I just read the whole story, just, and I reach over to pick up this butterfly, and it looks at me like I'm a butterfly. You know, I, <laughs> I don't deal with humans. I mean, my DNA is programmed to stay away from you. And it flies away. And it goes out about 40 yards, and it makes a U-turn, and it comes back, and it lands on my finger, right here. And I look at it, and 
I have never had this happen before in my life. I've had butterflies brush up against me once, but I've never had one just seek me out. So it lands here, and I immediately reach for my cell phone, <laughs> and I call Joanna, you remember? <laughs> and I said, Joanna, there's a monarch butterfly on my finger. You know what I just read to you this morning, she said, as she always does, she's so sweet and peaceful, meditate. I said, meditate? This is a monarch butterfly. I just wrote about him and Jack and all. She said, just go meditate on him. So I call another number. <laughs> and I call Reed, the president of Hay House, my buddy. All right? And I said, Reed, I read to you this morning about a monarch butterfly. I've now got one on my finger. It flew to me. He said, get a picture. I said, what are you talking about? Get a picture. I've got my bathing suit on and a cell phone. I don't have a camera. He said, we've been thinking about what's going to be on the cover of the book. He said, this is perfect. Right away, thinking about, you know, this is inspiration. This is like it's come to you for that reason. Get a picture. Get a picture. So I went, I took Joanna's advice, and I meditated. <laughs> now it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon when this happened, and I meditate for 30 minutes, and I called Joanna back, and I said, it's still with me. And I called Reed back, he said, get a picture. <laughs> so, now this butterfly I, is doing, uh, during the meditation, I, <laughs> I don't know how to say this without sounding strange, but it's, uh, it's okay, because every word of this is true. I swear to you, <laughs> this butterfly was trying to talk to me. <laughs> I don't know how close you've ever looked at a monarch butterfly, but it had tiny little, it had, almost like teeth, but they're not really teeth. <laughs> I know they don't have teeth. <laughs> and I bring the butterfly up real close to my eye, and it's, it's doing this. I swear. And I said, Jack? Because I had just written about him. I thought it was Jack. And then I took the butterfly and I put it over by my ear. In case it was making little sounds and it had a little, you know. I, I was just totally freaked out by this thing because it's now been an hour. It's been an hour. It's now, and it won't go. It's like I take it over here, I put it over on this finger, it, it's over here, and it won't go. And I'm like, okay, you know, that was nice. It won't leave. It's just connected to me. So I walk. I think, I said, maybe Reed's got a point here. Maybe we need to get a picture of this thing. So I decide to walk back to where I live. And I walk along now in the, on Maui in the afternoon, the trade winds come in, and they really blow hard in the afternoon. And I'm walking. The, the ocean is over here, the trades are coming in, and the butterfly's wings, toilet paper, are all the way bent over, but it won't leave. All the way bent, as far as it can go, and then I come back and I get out of the wind and it goes, you know, it's like flashing and making sounds, and I hold it up. <laughs> so I'm walking along the beach, uh, the, the beach there, and there's a little girl, who she's about four, five, six years old, who's totally traumatized because she got the wrong color Slurpee. <laughs> that's, that's her issue, okay? <laughs> Giving her mother more grief, you know. I want to tell her about Immaculate in the bathroom. I want to tell her, you know. I, she, <laughs> I don't want purple. I want yellow. You're giving me purple Slurpee. I hate purple Slurpees. Going on and on. It's real, you know. So I tap her on the shoulder, tears are on, and I just, well, I said, do uh, you want to see my pet butterfly? <laughs> I did. <laughs> she said, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? I said, Jack. <laughs> this is Jack. <laughs> I did. And she went, she went from, uh, I don't know how to say this. She, she went from pissed to blissed, okay? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they can use that. She went from, you know, being 
so upset to just this total state of bliss in just one second. The tears dried up. She smiled. She wanted to know if she could take it home. I said, no. <laughs> what are you talking about? This is my butterfly, huh? I get all the way back to where I'm going. It's now about 1.30 in the afternoon. About an hour and a half has gone by. I, <clears throat> I live in a place where they have a concierge downstairs, and there's a pool there, and there's a girl there. Her name is Cindy. And I, I walk upstairs, and I call Cindy down at the pool, and I said, Cindy, can you walk over to the ABC store and get a uh, portable camera and be here in uh, five minutes? She said, do you want me to come to your apartment with a portable camera in five minutes? <laughs> I said, yes, I do. <laughs> she said, why? I said, I want you to take a picture of me and my butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> she said, uh, what are you smoking? <laughs> I said, no, it's true. I found a butterfly, and she does yoga, and she's like one of these people. She, she said, okay. I also said, there's $100 in it for you if you can get here in five minutes. It manifests right there for you. You start noticing it, and you don't doubt it. You become a being of sharing. You become someone who acts as God acts which is someone who is constantly giving, who is forgiving. I received a letter in the mail that illustrates this, this phenomenon of dormant forces coming alive. The letter was from <clears throat> a woman who at that time was living in, uh, in Topeka, Kansas. She said, Dear Wayne, thank you so much for your presentations and your tapes. You are frequently my traveling companion as I drive in my job. I just wanted to add my testimony to the power of meditation and intention. I was an on and off meditator, but realized how much more smoothly my days went when I was on it. I visited Kenya, Africa, in June of 2002 and met an eight-year-old orphan girl there. As I sat on the ground, she crawled into my lap and a voice said, take her home, a dormant force. Take her home. She actually heard this voice. I physically turned around, but no one was there. Again, the voice said, take her home, but no one was there. Again, the voice said, take her home. I asked my 18-year-old daughter, who was with me on the trip, what she thought about my adopting this beautiful girl. And with the quickness of a sprinter, she replied, go for it. When we returned to the States a week later, I realized that if I didn't follow through with this adoption, I'd always regret it. Regret seemed much larger than the task of adopting. I began doing the meditation each morning, and through a series of miracles, the child was able to come to this country accompanied by a newly made friend. I named her Nellie and she has been a blessing to me and my other children. Nellie's adoption was part two of God's plan. Part one had unfolded a couple of years before, and I felt guided to sponsor a series of workshops for which I profited $10,000 with very little time or work. And guess what the final cost of adopting Nellie was? The first time I heard the voice, I chose to disregard it and or think it through, making lists of pros and cons but I couldn't rest until I proceeded with the workshops. That's how I explained to my family that I needed to proceed with adopting Nellie. Obedience had brought abundance into our lives, and now it was time to share that abundance. Nellie has brought the abundance of love and forgiveness into our home. She is truly a treasure. Thank you for sharing your gift of this wonderful meditation. It changed my life and the life of a little girl. What a beautiful letter. I invited Gail to come here, and Nellie, and I would like them to stand and be recognized right now. Gail and Nellie. Come on up here, Gail.
Inspiration. Gail and Ellie, you inspire me. You listened to your dream, and you didn't go with the cons. You went with the pros and made it happen. And we are honored to have both of you here. You're the beautiful people that this world needs more of. One of the things I believe about nobility, about true nobility, is that true nobility is not about being better than anyone else. It's about being better than you used to be. And I think your letter illustrates that when you move into spirit, dormant forces come alive, and you're just better than you used to be. And so are you, Ryan, and so are you, Immaculate, and so are all of us who listen and take that step to move into spirit. There's a man on this planet whom I've loved for many, many years. His name is Ram Das. Many of you have heard of him. He wrote a book back in the late 1960s called Be Here Now. It was the beginning. Ram Das taught me so much about what kind of speaker to be, what kind of human being to be. His teacher, Neem Karoli Baba in India, after he left Harvard and went to India, he was a Harvard professor, and he left all of that behind. And he met this great teacher who told him, serve God, feed people. And so he donated all of the proceeds of his uh, book, Be Here Now, to various uh, charities. Very seldom took a uh, speaking fee, had it all donated to charity. 1970, 1997, my friend Ram Das, as you see there, was uh, struck down with a stroke. And I have been working hard to help him to rehabilitate himself and uh, it's been one of my great joys and you'll know in a moment why I love this man so much and I've worked so hard to bring his uh, the attention of the world to where he is now he ended up with nothing because he gave it all away and uh, I came into his life in a series of quote fortuitous accidents that uh, have allowed me to be of service to him and a few years back <clears throat> he has many devotees, many people who just respect him so immensely, and I'm one of them. I, I think of him as one of the greatest speakers I've ever heard. He always entered a, a, a room from the back. Um, he was always open. He was always, had a great sense of humor, was able to poke fun at himself at any time, and uh, just great stories of India and meditation and so on. But someone I love very much. And... I'm going to show you what kind of a person he was, and I'm including this because it's about finding inspiration in anything. Like Immaculate's story tells about finding inspiration in the, in the midst of a genocide. Most of us won't have to encounter such, a, such an undertaking in our lives. But there are still many horrors and many difficulties and many struggles that show up in our life. And when we're in spirit, we move away from a sense of feeling sorry for ourselves and instead look for what the lesson is. Steve and Anita had a daughter named Rachel. Rachel was brutally murdered and her body was left. And they wrote to Ramdas, who was their teacher. And they said, how can we, after losing our daughter, how can we find spirit? How can we be inspired? How can we find God? in events such as this. And there are many of you watching who have encountered these kinds of acts and have also encountered uh, accidents and things that just don't seem to make sense. People just taken away from us at what are seemingly the wrong time. And this is what Ramdas wrote to Steve and Anita. It's one of the most beautiful letters I've ever read. He said, Dear Steve and Anita, Rachel finished her work on earth and left the stage in a manner that leaves those of us left behind with a cry of agony in our hearts as the fragile thread of our faith is dealt with so violently. Is anyone strong enough to stay conscious through such teachings as you are receiving? Probably very few. And even they would only have a whisper of equanimity and peace amidst the screaming trumpets of their rage, grief, horror, and desolation. 
I can't assuage your pain with any words, nor should I. For your pain is Rachel's legacy to you. Not that she or I would inflict such pain by choice, but there it is, and it must burn its purifying way to completion. For something in you dies when you bear the unbearable. And it is only in that dark night of the soul that you are prepared to see as God sees and to love as God loves. Now is the time to let your grief find expression, no false strength. Now is the time to sit quietly and speak to Rachel and thank her for being with you these few years and encourage her to go on with whatever her work is, knowing that you will grow in compassion and wisdom from this experience. In my heart, I know that you and she will meet again and again and recognize the many ways in which you have known each other. And when you meet, you will know in a flash what now it is not given to you to know, why this had to be the way it was. Our rational minds can never understand what has happened, but our hearts, if we keep them open to God, will find their own intuitive way. Rachel came through you to do her work on earth, which includes her manner of death. Now, her soul is free, and the love that you can share with her is invulnerable to the winds of changing time and space. In that deep love, include me. In love, Ramdas. I just don't think writing gets any better than that. And for those of you who can't figure it out, perhaps just listening to those words and being able to find inspiration, even in the most horrifying of times, when you're in spirit, you have a different kind of a knowing, one that doesn't require you to continue to suffer. And finally, number six, the rewards for being in spirit. You discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed that you could be. You practice radical humility. People who have inspired me in my life include Rosa Parks, who passed away not too long ago, Nelson Mandela, President Kennedy in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis when he went within and, and found a way by connecting to his private source to avoid a nuclear confrontation. Martin Luther King Jr.'s teachings about the only way to convert an enemy to a friend is, is through love. There's no other way. But you know, I would be remiss in a program on inspiration if I didn't include the person, perhaps the one person, who has been my greatest source of inspiration. I was born in 1940 the youngest of three. My father walked out. In fact, when my mother brought me home from the hospital, she told me that my father had moved in with another woman and left my oldest brother, who was four, and my next oldest brother, Dave, Jim and Dave, who was two, less than two, in the care of a four-year-old. He was uh, someone who paid no support, who wandered, who was frequently with other women, and so on. He was an alcoholic and um, visited a lot of uh, difficulty. There was no time in those days for welfare and so on. There was a depression. My brother was anemic. My mother was working for a while as a candy girl, earning $17 a week. And she put my brother Dave and myself into a series of foster homes sponsored by the Methodist Church because there just simply was no other way. But her nightmare was very, very real. Her family had been split, but she held a vision of re reuniting her family one day. She visited when it was possible, but we were 17 miles away in Mount Clemens, and it might as well have been 17,000 miles because she didn't drive, had no automobile, or any way to get out there hardly. Did what she could, but she could get a ride. But in 1949, she married a man that she really wasn't in love with just because she wanted to reunite her boys and got us all back together. Married another alcoholic, abusive man. When he
he wasn't drinking, he was fine, but he never wasn't drinking. And I can remember my mom waking up every morning in those years, when I was nine until I was about 17, getting up at five o'clock in the morning, taking three buses to work at Chrysler where she was a secretary, working all day, coming home, getting home at quarter to six off the bus at Peerless and Maras Road, and coming in and then making dinner for her three hungry boys, and doing this over and over and over again. Everyone in our neighborhood loved our home because my mom was this cool lady that just never was anything but positive and uplifting. She, uh, none of us would ever have even for a moment disrespected her. She didn't, de she didn't demand our respect, but uh, she certainly got it. She took incredible pride in herself, never would leave the home without her hair perfectly coiffed and, and the right clothes and so on. Weekends for my mom in those days um, were uh, spent down in the basement washing clothes and ironing clothes. Her mornings were spent making lunches, working, working, working. And then her own mother became very sick, and I watched as my mother took care of her mother. She had four other siblings, but um, it was always her. Everything was on her. She brought her into her home, cooked for her, took care of her until she passed away. And then, wonder of wonders, my stepfather, whom she had uh, finally divorced when I was 15, my stepfather, whom she had uh, finally divorced when I was 15, his alcohol use and tobacco use was finally taking its final toll. And I watched her as she went to the home of this man who had done nothing but abuse her in all the years he was with her. And she cooked for him. And she did his laundry for him. And she took care of him and provided for him. Today, she approaches 90. She still bowls twice a week. <laughs> she um, drives herself, takes care of herself doesn't complain. She lives and breathes love in every way. And in a book that I picked up by Michael Murphy called What I Meant to Say, what happened was uh, they were leaving a Thanksgiving dinner, and Michael looked at his mom, and they were exchanging pl uh, just sort of oh, polite ex expressions. And he it was just small talk. Yeah, Mom, thanks for Thanksgiving, and so on. And he looked, and he wrote this book, and he wrote these words. He said, what I meant to say was, how can I possibly say goodbye to the person who was the first to hold me, the first to feed me, and the first to make me feel loved? From a distance, I watch you move about, doing the mundane tasks that to everyone else seem so routine, but for me, the tasks you lovingly completed year after year built and reinforced the foundation, the structure that made my world a safe and comfortable place to grow. All that I am and all that I can be traced back to is you. Whatever accomplishments I have made along the way would not have occurred without first believing in myself. And you, you are the person who always believed in me. Now, with a family of my own, I am amazed at the number of times I hear your words flow from my mouth. This phenomenon was at first most irritating. <laughs> but now it warms me as I've come to understand that there's a part of you that will live on in me forever. When time parts us, I pray that you will reach across from the other side to again touch my face and whisper in my ear for your warm and gentle presence in my life. For this, I will always be most thankful. Yes, Mother. You inspire me. My mom.
Inspiration can come from anywhere. You can be a source of it, and you can find it in a book. You can find it in a painting. You can find it in a conversation. You can find it in a movie. I can't tell you how many of those kinds of things have been sources of inspiration to me. There was a great composer, his name was Don McLean, and he wrote some great music. Bye, bye, Miss American Pie. Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. You know that. You know the... <laughs> and he also wrote another song that he wrote after he read the story of a man who was a great artist. His name was Vincent van Gogh. And on the 30th of March in 1852, Anne Cornelia van Gogh gave birth to a brand new little boy named Vincent Wilhelm van Gogh. And he was stillborn. And she buried him the next day. One year to the day later, on March the 30th, 1853, Anne Cornelia van Gogh gave birth to a second little boy named Vincent Wilhelm van Gogh, who became one of the great artists, never sold a painting in his lifetime. But today, his paintings sell in the millions and millions of dollars. He was a troubled young man. He believed that he was a replacement child, some say. Some say that he was the same child who came back the second time. But he went through a troubled, troubled life. He struggled for his sanity. He struggled for it. And he did some beautiful paintings, some of the most beautiful ever done, of ragged people. And Don McLean read a book about Van Gogh and was so inspired just by the reading of that book that he wrote a song that he called Vincent. On the 27th of July, in 1890, at the age of 37, after having painted some of his most beautiful paintings, one of which was called Starry Night, Vincent van Gogh walked out to his arti artistic writing place with his brushes in one hand and a revolver in the other. And he placed it to his heart and he shot himself in the heart. It took him two days to die. And when Don McLean read about that, he wrote a song, the lyrics to which have always touched me touched me so deeply, starry, starry night. I'd like to close out this program on inspiration with all of these inspiring participants, with all of the wonderful help of all of you who have inspired me so much, with a quote from one of my great teachers, Ralph Waldo Emerson. We are very near to greatness. One step and we can be safe. Can't you take the one leap, just one leap? And from A Course in Miracles, I leave you with these beautiful words. There is a way of living, a way of living in the world that is not here, although it seems to be. You do not change appearance so you smile more frequently, your forehead is serene, your eyes are quiet, you walk this path as others walk, nor do you seem to be distinct from them, although you are indeed, thus can you serve them while you serve yourself. A new way of living, to be in spirit. Thank you for watching.